with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Carol Manny. I'm the membership coordinator here. And I have the pleasure today of co-leading the service with uh, our guest minister. Our guest minister today is the Reverend Lena Sinha, whose pronouns are Z, Zim, Zer. Z is a lifelong UU with a theology based in pleasure and irrepressible desire to save the world. Z helps people and organizations with power in their veins to put down the stigma of too much and use their power for good through an entrepreneurial com community ministry of values-oriented leadership, coaching, and consulting. As part of this ministry, Z has written, you're not too much, intensive lives in an expansive world, and is the developer of the Sinha Intensive Expansive Framework. Z lives and ministers in the Bay Area. We welcome Reverend Sinha via Zoom today. As we strive to live out our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind and body and spirit, we are mindful of those who came before us. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They aided the European settlers who came down the Illinois River. We offer our respect to the Peoria people for who they are in the past and who they are today. For those of you who are new to the congregation, thank you for joining us today. Uh, visiting a religious community is, can be a little um, intimidating. It's a leap of hope and, and faith and humanity. Uh, search for meaning and connection. We hope you can find that here. If you're online, please send a note through the church office uh, or directly to me. And if you're in person, please stay for coffee afterwards. I would like to meet you. Uh, there are a few notes as we gather in person. Turn off your devices. Um, also part of COVID precautions where everyone over the age of two is masking except at the pulpit and outside. So we'll be able to have coffee outside. Um, no food and drink in the sanctuary. We ask folks to socially distance and our COVID re numbers unfortunately remain kind of high in this area. So if you do test positive for COVID after the service or any time here, please uh, let the church office know. I want a, a quick note from Reverend Jennifer. Uh, she, and I think she sent an email out, but tonight at six o'clock, she's gonna have a listening circle. Um, so people can come and talk and listen and just um, be there with each other about the uh, Supreme Court decision about abortion. So six o'clock out on the patio for that. So. If you will please rise in body and spirit and join us in our opening hymn, Love Will Guide Us.
mind your shoes. The place hasn't been swept in a week. We look, we have kids. You're fine. Just like you are welcome. Can I get you a drink? We have water, juice, milk. This mason jar is the last clean one. Sorry. Sorry, the dishwasher is still resting. Good morning. Hey, listen, listen. What are we going to do? Come, let us worship together. We light our chalice this morning, remembering that in churches around the world, other Unitarian Universalists are also lighting a chalice. And so we are in community together. So this is the time traditionally known as the story for all ages. I like to think of it as just a, an early reading in the service. And this story is called How We Know, and I had to write it because we don't seem to have a whole lot for children about Unitarian Universalism, and that's the story I wanted to tell. So this is the story of Anjali. She was a Unitarian Universalist and a kid. She had lots of other friends who had lots of other religions, and sometimes they would talk about it. Her Jewish friends knew they were Jewish. They prayed on Friday night and Saturday, and sometimes they covered their heads. They did good deeds called mitzvahs. They talked and argued and prayed to their God. Sometimes they ate special foods for a holiday. They sang together, and they tried hard to follow Jewish law. And that was how they knew they were Jewish. She had Muslim friends. They prayed five times a day and they ate special food sometimes. They fasted for Ramadan and they gave to the poor and sometimes they wore special clothes or covered their heads or faces. And that's how they knew they were Muslim. She had Hindu friends who lit incense and had what seemed like a million holidays and made and ate special foods and had altars in their houses with lots of idols on them. And they said prayers and rang bells and some of them were vegetarian and that was how they knew they were Hindu. And she had Christian friends, and some of them lit candles and rang bells and burned incense, and some of them didn't. Some of them danced, and some of them didn't. Some of them went to church all day long on Sunday. Some of them went for an hour. Some of them didn't go at all. Some of them did good deeds for their religion. Most of them went to churches where grown-ups took communion and where they talked about how to be more like Jesus. They were all being Christians in their own way, and that was how they knew they were Christian. Pretty much everyone in every religion almost sang some kind of songs, but some didn't. There was a lot of variety. And they all kind of talked about their lives. And so one day, one of her friends asked her, how, how do you know you're a Unitarian Universalist? What do, what do you, 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 Unitarian Universalists, she said. What do Unitarian Universalists do? She sat and thought for a while. That's one of the first things Unitarian Universalists do. And then she said, well, you know, almost everything I do. When I recycle bottles and cans, I'm thinking about the interdependent web and how to take care of the earth and everything that's here with us, all of us together. And that's my kind of Unitarian Universalist. 
And when I go swimming, I think about how amazing and big and just how big and amazing everything is and how small I am and how much we don't know. And I'm, I'm in awe. And that is my kind of Unitarian Universalist. And when I eat dinner with my mom and Baba, we talk about things that matter to us and share ideas and decide together how to do things for our family. So like last month, we went to a protest and then wrote letters and talked to our representatives about prison reform. And then mom took a chance and got arrested because we were mad about the immigrant kids in cages. We believe in participating in democracy and trying to change things to be better. And that is our kind of Unitarian Universalist. We, in my family, we try to eat food that grew nearby when we can. We think about where the food we buy and the clothes we wear come from and how it was made because every person matters. And sometimes people get hurt making the stuff we need and we don't want to hurt people. And that's my kind of Unitarian Universalist. We talk to people and we try to make connections with the families around us. We connect with ourselves deep inside and get really quiet and try to know what to do. And then we talk to other people and we learn from them too. We're happy when we see a caterpillar or a bird or a tree. Baba prays, mom doesn't. I sometimes talk to rocks. And we try to take care of each other and everything around us. We go to church and we give money to important causes. And at church, we have an open dinner every month where anyone who wants can come for free. And all of that is our kind of Unitarian Universalist. We sing songs and we light a chalice to feel connected to each other. And we don't really have holidays that are all our own, but we do have four days a year that we share something around in the congregation. And that's a tradition that we got from our heritage, which is Christian. And we inherited some other stuff from that too. And then we inherited other things from other places. And we believe that the whole world is full of smart and wise things. And that's all where we come from. And there's no one place that's all of who we are, not anymore. Sometimes we sit in a circle and everyone helps leads wor lead worship. And sometimes we worship over a meal. Sometimes we sit in rows and listen to a minister. Sometimes we have music for the whole service. Sometimes we skip church because we have to go shout in the streets or talk to our congressperson. Because church is everywhere. Sometimes this and sometimes that is part of how we are Unitarian Universalist. No two Unitarian Universalists are exactly alike. No two of us believe exactly the same thing, even if we believe the same thing about God, which we don't all, but we have some things in common, and we try to live our lives like that all the time, not just one day a week. We believe that our lives and our words should match up, and we help each other do that together, and that is how we know we are Unitarian Universalist. Here ends the story. Thank you. That was a wonderful story, Reverend. Thank you very much. As we approach our, the time for our offering, give what you will for the church that has meant so much to you, for the church that has meant so much for, to those who came before you, and for the church that will mean so much to people you will never know. Give what you will, for you are a generous people. After the ushers pass the plates, um, we will have time for meditation and candles and do it after joys and sorrows. All right. So the offering will be given and greatly received. Let the plates come forward.
Jodell, we need one another when we mourn and would be comforted and are in trouble and afraid, when we despair and temptation and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another when we would accomplish some good purpose and cannot do it alone. In the hour of our successes, when we look for someone to share our triumphs and in the hour of defeat, when with encouragement, we might endure and rise again. We need one another when we come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives, we are in need and others are in need of us. This is the time for sharing of our joys and sorrows. And um, there were no joys listed from the congregation. So I hope you don't mind I went and found a couple from the world at large, so we could have a couple of joys to celebrate. One is um, Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov sold his Nobel Peace Prize for 103.5 million to give to Ukrainian children. That's quite something. And if you're a Bloodhound fan, Trump at the Bloodhound won uh, the 146th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, first bloodhound ever. So a couple of things to celebrate. I think there's always small things to celebrate in our life. And today our sorrows, um, our hearts are with Shirley Cunningham today and the many, many friends of Roger and Shirley Cunningham. Shirley's husband, Roger, passed away this week. He was at home with Shirley and um, there were many wonderful, loving friends that have stepped in to um, show their support and love for Shirley. He was a longtime UU member and will be missed by many. Um, so we are going to have our moment of meditation, but before that, the Reverend has a prayer for us. I thought it appropriate to add a prayer to the service this morning. So let us gather ourselves in the spirit of meditation and prayer. Let us pray for every person of every gender and every body whose sacred right to bodily sovereignty has been compromised. Let us pray for every life that has been lost and every life that will be lost because of interference between a person and their medical needs and choices. Let us pray. For every faith tradition and every person of every religion whose rights to free religious expression are being restricted, let us pray. For the ways in which religion has been used in service of evil, let us pray. For our own failures and our own silences, let us pray. For every broken heart, for every forced sterilization, for every forced death, for every bit of injustice exacted upon the bodies of this world and this country, let us pray. Let us pray with our hearts and our words, and then let us pray with our bodies, with our actions, with our choices, with our lives, our bodies as vehicles for justice, our bodies as vehicles for a better world, our lives devoted to the inherent worth and dignity of every person, to autonomy, to more rights than a corpse, to self-determination, to community, to justice, equity, compassion, to interdependence, to freedom, to love. May we be more in this moment than ever before, 
more deeply faithful, more deeply religious, more deeply together, more collectively emboldened and outspoken, more collectively supportive in heart and in material care. May we be more ourselves that we may serve and transform the world in the name of all that is holy. We pray. Amen. Our reading this morning are the words of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She was quoting herself in a tweet from a Q&A she had participated in. Now is the time to stick together. My honest view is that things are likely going to get harder before they get better, and we will need to stick together. What is important in these moments, in moments like these, is not to think in binaries, good, bad, screwed, not screwed. There is no doubt that things are bad. Some things, really bad, and they may likely get worse, but that does not preclude the fact that slowly but surely some good can be growing as other things fall apart. This is not some syrupy, sweet, silver lining case for optimism. Rather, it is really about a choice all of us will have to make in life, either consciously or unconsciously. Will I be a person who is safe and creates good for others? Will I be a person who primarily minds my business and serves myself or try to be something, part of something bigger? Or will I just be a passive, neutral observer of it all? What I sometimes tell my staff is that the world we are fighting for is already here. It exists in small spaces, places, and communities. We don't have to deal with the insurmountable burden of coming up with novel solutions to all the world's problems. Much of our work is about scaling existing solutions, many created by small committed groups of people that others haven't seen or don't even know are around the corner. So while we can't change the world in a day, we can and do have the power to make our own world within our four walls or our own blocks. We can grow from there with the faith that someone out there everywhere, uh, somewhere out there, everywhere, others are doing the same and we will come together. That's why if you're a parent, how you parent matters. If you're a neighbor, how you are a neighbor matters. Many of our biggest problems are results of massively scaled up isolation from others. That means many of our solutions can be found in creating community. Ultimately, we live in this world and in this time, we have no choice but to engage in it while we're here. Even running away is a form of engagement. So will your engagement hurt or heal, build or bring down? There is no neutral choice, so we can at least do our best to make good ones and learn and do better the next day. Here ends the reading. Oh, thank you all for having me here. My name again is Leela Sinha. My pronouns are Z, Zim, and Zur. And I serve as an entrepreneurial community minister in um, Berkeley, California, and primarily, honestly, on the internet. I have a very spoken word, beat poetry, inflected style of preaching, and I like to warn people before I do it so that you can know that it will come in a different way. The words might come faster. Just let them flow over you. The ones you need will sink in, and all the other ones can just wash away. It's okay. Especially today, it's okay. <laughs> so good morning. 
I come before you today with a kind of a bubbling up rage. In the early 90s, there was this movie called Better Than Chocolate that I just loved. It was a chick flick for young lesbians, which in the early 90s, that was a miracle in itself. It was sponsored by the Canadian Arts Council, which, by the way, does some amazing work with their sponsorships. The only other movie like that at the time was an art film made on a low budget in Chicago called Go Fish, which was also good, but it was from a generation earlier. Our queer generations tend to be short and punctuated by violence. I straddled that generation gap in the queer community like it was my lifeline, like it was my home base, because it was. I was caught between the first generation thrust into the spotlight by gay bashing and the AIDS pandemic, and a future into which equal marriage would be born alongside queer bashing and the AIDS pandemic. And in this movie, Better Than Chocolate, there was a scene with a trans woman character who'd been attacked. And she's trying to work it out. She's with her friend. She's processing what just happened to her. And they're encouraging her to move away from being like upset that maybe she did something wrong and into really feeling empowered. And eventually she gets to, I feel a little kind of a, a sort of a bubbling up rage. And I cannot stop thinking about that in this moment. A bubbling up rage. Rage because we saw this coming, not just since May, but for the last six years, for the last 20 years, since 1980. So my entire conscious life, basically, we saw this coming. It was a train wreck coming. And there was some fighting against it and lots of confusion. And there was a lot of fighting for it. And there was a lot of strategy for it and not much against it. And now here we are. And our imaginations may or may not be worse than what's actually coming next, but it does not look good especially not for people like me. But I come before you today to ask the question that I only have because of who we are. What are we going to do about it? And I don't mean some generic we out there. I mean, what are we going to do about it as Unitarian Universalists? And I don't just mean protests or even resolutions of immediate witness. Again, some of you have been long at this longer than I have been alive again and again and again, and those things have their place. But I learned that I had the right to be my entire self in church from being a Unitarian Universalist. That's where I learned I had the right to exist. I learned that from you, collectively from us, collectively from the institution, from the ideals. And then I also learned that the ideals don't always match our behavior in church. But today, I'm asking that we live up to ourselves, because this is one of the only places where I feel like I can actually come and claim and demand and insist that we be who we say we are. I need us, y'all. I need to believe us when we say things. You all believed in me when I was a kid. You all believed in me when I was growing up and I was moving into leadership and I was finding my feet and my voice in the space that I was going to occupy and I was finding what mattered to me and I was finding my skills and I was discovering that there was a place where I could be loud and real and fail and get up and be full and human and that this place was that place. Our congregations, our denomination, our national organization, our international presence, this was that place. And so now I need to believe in you. I'm going to believe in you so I can believe us when we say things. That's Unitarian Universalist faith in action. These were the places where I could actually live into what I later recognized as a call. And my call was sort of like my coming out. I didn't really see it coming. I just kind of moved into it and then it smacked me in the face from behind. And here we are. Here we are. And I am fully this person. Everything you can see and some things you can probably guess. And I am the living presence of Unitarian Universalism and my existence is threatened. Because people are trying to take my rights away. And some of those people are outside our walls, but some of them are inside. I am grateful for the way the board vote went at General Assembly. But I learned that I had the right to be fully this person with this autonomy, full autonomy, full presence, even in all of the ways that I don't quite match here from being here. <laughs> and it's not that I don't match the values or the ideals of Unitarian Universalism. I am literally cut from this cloth. What I don't match is the behavior of Unitarian Universalism and the way that the institution in its quest for comfort fails, has historically failed we're having faith here, to live out what we claim to espouse, what we claim to strive for. 
I come before you today as a child of this faith, as an adult of this faith, as clergy of this faith, asking you to change that. The idealistic 14-year-old who signed that membership book in Westport, Connecticut, believes in you. We have always been good at outward-facing activism. We've always been good at that, sometimes good at the wrong thing, sometimes denominational-wide, we've picked the wrong causes. Sometimes our leaders have been terrible people. But we have been pretty good, mostly, at outward-facing activism, consistently. Mostly, we pick the morally right side of the conversation. Mostly, we're able to move the needle at least a little bit. That's something we are consistently good at. And that's why I think, for a while, we've tried to build our whole institutional identity around that. But as a lifelong UU, I'm here to tell you that's not right. I mean, it's just wrong. That's not all of who Unitarian Universalism is. It's just the icing on the cake. It's just the outside shell. We really get confused. And I think it's partly because we don't have conversion classes for people who arrive as adults. And so there's no lesson in how to practice Unitarian Universalism that you can take when you get here if you didn't grow up learning it. There are no lessons in the skills that we need to practice Unitarian Universalism over the long haul in the hard and the quiet moments. And we try to sneak it in, your leadership, we try to sneak it in like broccoli into brownies, but let me tell you, it's not enough. This much broccoli is not a serving. We are not learning to practice Unitarian Universalism together. And so when we can't sneak it in enough, then what we end up with is folks who think they know how to be Unitarian Universalist and want to be Unitarian Universalist, know how to be outwardly Unitarian Universalist because we do that well and we know how to teach that. But what we don't teach is Unitarian Universalism internally in our congregations, in our committees, in our communities, in our hearts. Teaching that pause where you stop and get in touch with what you really mean and what it's going to do in the conversation before you say it, because that's Unitarian Universalist. The practice of sitting with one's own connection to whatever one finds holy. I don't, I don't have to argue about what you believe about God and weaving the link between that and action, getting so deep in relationship with that thing that you can touch it at a moment's notice every time you need it. The practice of being in community communicating risk and repair and care and trust and joy, knowing other religious traditions well enough to respect them and care for them and converse with them and collaborate with them even when they don't make sense to us. Knowing our own polity, what's happening at General Assembly and why, who goes and what power the General Assembly could have. We need to know this in all our congregations. Some congregations do better than others, not because everyone should go to General Assembly, but because if you're going to be part of a democratic institution, you have to understand how it works. You have to understand how it works because you have to understand that anytime you're in a democracy, it's not you versus them. It's you are them. You are the holder of the power. You are the holder of agency. No one is taking your agency away. It's in you. It's in you, it's in each of you, it's in each of us. It's in us. We are all part of it. The UUA is not some external thing out there, it's us. And the United States is not some external thing out there, it's us. We are all part of a democracy and the way that democracy is operating right now, the way that democracy is operating right now, the things that are happening with the mechanisms that we have in place that we are participating in, rights being taken away from groups of people, people being killed, people jailed at the borders, all of that, we are collectively participating in it. And we do know how to protest, and we do, and we know how to write letters, and we do. But let's be real, something is not working, because if it were, this mess wouldn't be happening. Something about the impact, the connection between the people and the institution of power and the people and each other is broken. And as you may have guessed, I'm mad about it. I come before you with this little sort of a bubbling up rage. And the thing that makes that rage non-lethal is my ethics, my faith practice. It's my religion. What our faith brings to the table is a kind of ethics, a kind of morality that allows us to act and act together out of something bigger than that rage. But what our faith isn't doing is creating the structure underneath it. That structure is what builds the connection between the people and the power and the people and the people. We are good at being public and visible and loud in protest. Now we need to shore up our own foundations and be loud in presence 
because that is where the deep change happens. We need to be Unitarian Universalist inside ourselves, inside our hearts and inside our communities. We need to be who we say we are. Our faith tradition teaches us not to be internally destructive. I learned that at church, but in youth group at church, I also learned there that change isn't destruction. Change is life. Change is growth. Living communities move or they're dying. So we can't be destructive, but we can't be static. Not destructive to ourselves, inherent worth and dignity is sometimes hardest to practice solo, and not to our people, not where and when we gather, which is not to say we can't disagree. We absolutely can and should. Discussion is part of who we are. We are, I am fond of saying, a dialogical faith tradition. We're in dialogue all the time with somebody. And it's not to say that we shouldn't call out oppression when it happens. 100% we should. Those are productive and important conversations to have. What we need to do is develop the skills to have those conversations about love and oppression and faith and theology and spirit, to have conversations about bias and prejudice, to have conversations about systemic injustice and personal failing and individual injustice and personal transformation and allow those conversations to change us without destroying ourselves. So here's what I learned between age 14 and 18 about that in church. First, we have got to listen to the most marginalized. We have to listen to the stories of people with the actual lived experience and just believe them without arguing. That's not a place for debate. We have to allow ourselves to care for one another. Even when it's painful to be close to someone who's hurting or to hear their story, we have to allow ourselves to care for one another. We have to be present with one another. And when we're doing that, we have to have healthy boundaries. And we have to have mutual aid, material aid, money and food and housing and transportation. We need to literally support one another. We have to be creative and disruptive. Unitarian Universalism, if nothing else, we have a legacy of creative disruption. We are famously disruptive. We do not believe in following the rules if the rules were meant to be broken. So what rules have we believed in our heads that if we could just do an end run around them, it would allow us to move closer to justice? What rules have we got written down that we need to question? For example, Robert's rules of order, not necessarily the best way to have a group conversation. What is causing oppression that we need to question and change? What is the legacy of colonialism that we need to question and change? Another thing I learned is to get on the bus if it's going to the right neighborhood. I learned that it's okay as a leader to follow, and even if they're not going to the exact perfect place I want to go, if they're going close, I'm going to work with them. And that more than okay, one of the most powerful things you can do as a leader is to follow another leader. I cannot tell you as a leader what a relief it is when someone else who is a leader gets in line behind me. And what a relief it is to give up being in charge of everything for a minute and get in line behind someone else. It doesn't even have to be perfect. You can still get on the bus and be like, okay, that's not how I would do it, but it seems like a reasonable plan. Let's go. And then you encourage everyone else to get on the bus. And we can also do this in our external work. We do not have to and should not be trying to lead everything. We can trust others. I learned that moments of personal intimacy are important. They are absolutely critical for building a relationship, which is to say, leave some space and some time and some energy for telling stories and making connections that are not directly related to the agenda and rearrange the agenda if something really big is happening. Rewrite your sermon four times if something really big is happening. People matter. Agendas are not that important. I learned that everyone has needs, including me, and that my needs matter. And so do everyone else's, but not in the face of harm. I learned that intentions are important, but impact is where the rubber meets the road. And I learned that if there's any line in the Bible that I have the most complicated relationship with, it is the greatest of these is love. The context for that line is complicated, but the individual line, the greatest of these is love, echoes something I saw a long time ago. When I was a little kid, we, my family, went to the Unitarian Universalist Church in Stamford, Connecticut, and on the front of their pulpit at the time, I don't know if it's still there, there was a bas-relief chalice in the style of the UUSC. And over it, in Gothic letters, it said, God is love. 
Now, at the time, I was an atheist, my parents are atheists, and so I didn't really know what to do with that, because this was supposed to be a space where atheists were welcome, and I didn't know if that meant we didn't actually belong in the church, but I knew it was sort of historical, so eh. But then after a while, I realized I could flip it around. I was learning to become a Unitarian Universalist. I was learning to claim agency. And so I said, what if love is God? which means love is that all-powerful force in the universe that brings us together. And that helps us be more than we can think, we think we can be alone. I could get behind that. Love is the force. It is that force, but the force alone doesn't do anything. It needs something to act with and something to act on. You know why our youth and young adults are so amazing? because they practice our faith together and alone, most of them every day, that love is in action, act with, act on. They practice love with each other. They practice communication with each other. They practice conflict navigation and trust and repair. And they believe in us, or at least they believe in themselves. They believe in Unitarian Universalism. The adults eh, were kind of sketchy. So here's the dream from my 14 and 16 and 18 year old self to you. I, I think we need conversion classes. I know that's a weird place to end the sermon in a week where it feels like what we need to do is shout in the streets, but we need to work on all these skills for everyone, not just those of us who got here before we were 18. We can't be that best kept secret. We can't have that be the only way to enter deeply into Unitarian Universalism to get here as a kid. Like that can't be the only way in because that's what's actually going to change us. And the world is deep practice. Everyone should know about us. Everyone should have access to those skills, which means everyone needs to learn and everyone starts with us. I would love to live in a world where when I walk into a room and say, I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister, certain kinds of oppressive conservatives shake in their boots and nobody says, you know what? But until we live in that world where everybody already knows that we exist, who we are, how they can come to us, what we can give them, sucker, support, community, a place to grow theologically, before we can do that, we have to have an identity to offer. We have to really have those things. We have to have a unified sense of ourselves. And that means that the people who arrive after age 18 have to have the same tools and skills as the people who arrived before 18 are given so that we can be one church, so that we can be one faith so that we can be one association, and so that we all know how to be Unitarian Universalist from the core out. Because otherwise, no matter how much we do in the world, it's hollow. And change doesn't come from hollow. Let's really change ourselves this time. Let's work on it. Let's teach. Let's learn. Let's become one Unitarian Universalism, one faith tradition. And from that, let's change the world. Blessed be, and amen.
We extinguish this flame, but not its meaning and mission in our hearts. Deepest, Deepest Unitarian Uniter Universalism you know. Shine it forth into the world and shine it deep into yourselves. Make the world a better place starting here. Go in peace and go in love. Thank you.